The Travels of Captain William Dampierre, Chapter 1 An account of the author's return out of the South Seas to his landing near Cape St. Lawrence in the Isthmus of Darien with an occasional description of the Mosquito Indians. Here it begins. April the 17th, 1681. About ten o'clock in the morning, being twelve leagues northwest from the island Plata, we left Captain Sharp and those who were willing to go with him in the ship and embarked into our lanch and canoes, designing for the river of Santa Maria in the Gulf of St. Michael, which is about two hundred leagues from the Isle of Plata. We were in number forty-four white men who bore arms, a Spanish Indian who bore arms also, and two Mosquito Indians who always bear arms amongst the privateers, and are much valued by them for striking fish and turtle or tortoise, and manatee or sea cow, and five slaves taken in the South Seas, who fell to our share. The craft which carried us was a lanch, a long boat, one canoe, and another canoe, which had been sewn asunder in the middle, in order to have made bumkins, or vessels for carrying water, if we had not separated from our ship. This we joined together again, and made it tight, providing sails to help us along, and for three days before we parted we sifted so much flour as we could well carry. We rubbed up twenty or thirty pound of chocolate with sugar to sweeten it. These things in a kettle the slaves carried also on their backs after we landed. And because there were some who designed to go with us that we knew were not able to march, we gave out that if any man faltered in the journey over land, he must expect to be shot to death. For we knew that the Spaniards would soon be after us, and one man falling into their hands could be the ruin of us all by giving an account of our strength and our condition, yet this would not deter them from going with us. We had but little wind when we parted from the ship, but before twelve o'clock the sea breeze came in strong, which was like to founder us before we got in with the shore. For our security, therefore, we cut up an old dry hide that we brought with us, and we barricaded the lanch all around it to keep the water out. About ten o'clock at night, we got in about seven leagues to windward of Cape Passau under the line. Then it proved calm. We lay and drove all night, being fatigued the preceding day. The eighteenth day, we had little wind till the afternoon. Then we made sail, standing along the shore to the northward, having the wind at south-southwest, fair weather. At seven o'clock we came abreast of Cape Passau. We found a small bark at an anchor in a small bay to leeward of the Cape, which we took, our own boats being too small to transport us. We took her just under the equinoctial line. She was not only a help to us, but in taking her we were safe from being described. We did not design to have meddled with any when we parted with our consorts, nor to have seen any if we could have helped it. The bark came from Gallio, laden with timber, and was bound for Guayaquil. The nineteenth day in the morning we came to an anchor about twelve leagues to the southward of Cape St. Francisco to put our new bark into a better trim. In three 
a four hours time, we finished our business and came to sail again. We steered along the coast with the wind at south-southwest, intending to touch at Gorgonia. Being to the northward of Cape St. Francisco, we met with very wet weather. But the wind continuing, we arrived at Gorgonia the twenty-fourth day in the morning, before it was light. We were afraid to approach it in the daytime, for fear the Spaniards should lie there for us, it being the place where we careened lately, and where they might expect us. When we came ashore, we found the Spaniards had been there to seek after us, by a house they had built, which would entertain one hundred men, and by a great cross before the doors. This was token enough that the Spaniards did expect us this way again. Therefore we examined our prisoners, if they knew anything of it, who confessed they had heard of a periago, or a large canoe, that rode with fourteen oars, which was kept in a river on the main, and once in two or three days came over to Gorgonia purposely to see for us and then having discovered us, she was to make all speed to Panama with the news, where they had three ships ready to send after us. We lay here all the day. We scrubbed our new bark, that if ever we should be chased, we might the better escape. We filled our water, and in the evening went from thence, having the wind at southwest, a brisk gale. The twenty-fifth day we had much wind and rain. We lost the canoe that had been cut and was joined together. We would have kept all our canoes to carry us up the river, the bark not being so convenient. The twenty-seventh day we went from thence with a moderate gale of wind at southwest. In the afternoon we had excessive showers of rain. The twenty-eighth day was very wet all the morning. Betwixt ten and eleven it cleared up, and we saw two great ships about a league and half to the westward of us we being then two leagues from the shore, and about ten leagues to the southward of Point Garachina. These ships had been cruising between Gorgonia and the Gulf six months, but whether our prisoners did know it, I cannot tell. We presently furled our sails. We rode in close under the shore, knowing that they were cruisers. For if they had been bound to Panama, this wind would have carried them thither, and no ships bound from Panama come on this side of the bay, but keep the north side of the bay till as far as the keys of Quibo to the westward. And then, if they are bound to the southward, they stand over and may fetch Galeo, or betwixt it and Cape San Francisco. The glare did not continue long before it rained again. It kept us from the sight of each other. But if they had seen and chased us, we would we were resolved to run our bark and canoes ashore, and take ourselves to the mountains, and travel over land. For we knew that the Indians which lived in these parts never had any commerce with the Spaniards, so we might have had a chance for our lives. The twenty-ninth day, nine o'clock in the morning, we came to an anchor at Point Garachina, about seven leagues from the Gulf of St. Michael, which was the place where we first came into the South Seas, and the way by which we designed to return. Here we lay all the day, we went ashore, we dried our clothes, we cleaned our guns, we dried our ammunition, and we fixed ourselves against our enemies, if we should be attacked. For we did expect to find some opposition at landing. We likewise kept a good lookout all the day, 
for fear of those two ships that we saw the day before. The 30th day in the morning, 8 o'clock, we came into the Gulf of St. Michael's Mouth. For we put from Point Garachina in the evening, designing to have reached the islands in the gulf before day, that we might the better work our escape from our enemies, if we should find any of them waiting to stop our passage. About nine o'clock we came to an anchor a mile without a large island, which lies four miles from the mouth of the river, we had other small islands without us, and might have gone up into the river, having a strong tide of flood, but would not adventure farther till we had looked well about us. We immediately sent a canoe ashore on the island, where we saw what we always feared, a ship at the mouth of the river, lying close by the shore, and a large tent by it by which we found it would be a hard task for us to escape them. When the canoe came aboard with this news, some of our men were a little disheartened, but it was no more than I ever expected. Our care was now to get safe over land, seeing we could not land here according to our desire. Therefore, before the tide of flood was spent, we manned our canoe, rode again to the island to see if the enemy was yet in motion. When we came ashore, we dispersed ourselves all over the island to prevent our enemies from coming any way to view us. And presently, after a high water, we saw a small canoe coming over from the ship to the island that we were on, which made us all get into our canoe and wait their coming, and we lay close till they came within pistol-shot of us, and then being ready, we started out and took them. There were in her one white man and two Indians, who being examined, told us that the ship which we saw at the river's mouth had lain there six months guarding the river, waiting for our coming, that she had twelve guns and one hundred and fifty seamen and soldiers, that the seamen lay all aboard, but the soldiers lay ashore in their tent, that there were three hundred men at the mines, who all had small arms, and would be aboard in two tides time. They likewise told us that there were two ships cruising in the bay, between this place and Gorgonia, the biggest had twenty guns and two hundred men, the other had ten guns and a hundred and fifty men. Besides all this, they told us that the Indians on this side of the country were our enemies. This was the worst news of all. However, we presently brought these prisoners aboard. We got under sail turning out with the tide of ebb, for it was not convenient to stay longer there. We did not long consider what to do, but intended to land that night, or the next day be times. For we did not question, but we should either get a good commerce with the Indians, by such toys as we had purposely brought with us, or else force our way through their country, in spite of all their opposition. And we did not fear what these Spaniards could do against us, in case they should land and come after us. We had a strong southerly wind, it blew right in, and the tide of ebb being far spent, we could not turn out. I persuaded them to run into the river of Congo, which is a large river, about three leagues from the island where we lay, which, with a southerly wind, we could have done, and when we were got so high as the tide flows, then we might have landed. 
but all the arguments I could use were not of force sufficient to convince them that there was a large river so near us. But they would land somewhere they neither did know how, where, nor when. When we had rowed and rowed against the wind all night, we just about got Cape St. Lorenzo in the morning, and sailed about four miles farther to the westward, and run into a small creek within two keys, or little islands, and rowed up to the head of the creek, being about a mile up, and there it was we landed, May the 1st, of 1681. We got out all our provisions and our clothes, and then we sunk our vessel. While we were landing and fixing our snapsacks to march, our mosquito Indians struck a plentiful dish of fish, which we immediately dressed, and therewith satisfied our hunger. Having made mention of the Mosquito Indians, it may not be amiss to conclude this chapter with a short account of them. They are tall, well-made, raw bond, lusty, strong, nimble of foot, long-visaged, lank black hair, look stern, hard-favored, and of a dark copper-color complexion. They are but a small nation or family, and not one hundred men of them in number, inhabiting on the main, on the north side, near Cape Gracia Dios, between Cape Honduras and Nicaragua. They are very ingenious at throwing the lance, fizzgig, harpoon, or any manner of dart, being bred to it from their infancy. For the children, imitating their parents, never go abroad without a lance in their hands, which they throw at any object, till use hath made them masters of the art. Then they learn to put by a lance, arrow, or dart. The manner is thus. Two boys stand at a small distance and dart a blunt stick at one another, each of them holding a small stick in his right hand, with which he strikes away that which was darted at him. As they grow in years, they become more dexterous and courageous, and then they will stand a fair mark to any one that will shoot arrows at them which they will put by with a very small stick, no bigger than the rod of a fowling piece. And when they are grown to be men, they will guard themselves from arrows, though they come very thick at them, provided two do not happen to come at once. They have extraordinary good eyes, and will decry, descry a sail at sea farther, and see anything better than we. Their chiefest employment in their own country is to strike fish, turtle, or manatee, the manner of which I describe elsewhere in chapter 3. For this they are esteemed and coveted by all privateers, for one or two of them in a ship will maintain one hundred men. So that when we careen our ships, we choose commonly such places, where there is plenty of turtle or manatee for these mosquito men to strike. And it is very rare to find privateers destitute of one or more of them, when the commander or most of the men are English. But they do not love the French, and the Spaniards they hate mortally. When they come among privateers, they get the use of guns, and they prove very good marks. They behave themselves very bold in fight, and never seem to flinch, nor to hang back. For they think that the white men with whom they are know better than they do when it is best to fight, and let the disadvantage of their party be never so great. They will never yield nor give back while any of their parties stand. 
I could not perceive any religion nor any ceremonies or superstitious observations among them, being ready to imitate us in whatsoever they saw us do at any time. Only they seemed to fear the devil, whom they call Wallisaw, and they say he often appears to some among them, whom our men commonly call their priest, when they desire to speak with him on urgent business. But the rest know not anything of him, nor how he appears, otherwise than as these priests tell them. Yet they all say they must not anger him, for then he will beat them, and that sometimes he carries away these their priests. Thus much I have heard from some of them who speak good English. They marry but one wife, with whom they live till death separates them. At their first coming together, the man makes a very small plantation, for there is land enough, and they may choose what spot they please. They delight to settle near the sea or by some river, for the sake of striking fish, their beloved employment. Far within land there are other Indians, with whom they are always at war. After the man hath cleared a spot of land, and hath planted it, he seldom minds it afterwards, but leaves the managing of it to his wife, and he goes out striking. Sometimes he seeks only for fish, at other times for turtle or manatee, and whatever he gets, he brings home to his wife, and never stirs out to seek for more till it is all eaten. When hunger begins to bite, he either takes his canoe and seeks for more game at sea, or walks out into the woods and hunts about for peccary, wari, each a sort of wild hogs or deer, and seldom returns empty-handed, nor seeks for any more so long as any of it lasts. Their plantations are so small that they cannot subsist with what they produce, for their largest plantations have not above twenty or thirty plantain trees, a bed of yams, potatoes, a bush of Indian pepper, and a small spot of pineapples, which last fruit is a main thing they delight in, for with these they make a sort of drink which our men call pine drink, much esteemed by these mosquito men, and to which they invite each other to be merry, providing fish, in flesh also. Whoever of them makes of this liquor treats his neighbors, making a little canoe full at a time, and so enough to make them all drunk. And it is seldom that such feasts are made, but the party that makes them hath some design, either to be revenged for some injury done him, or to debate of such differences as have happened between him and his neighbors, and to examine into the truth of such matters. Yet before they are warmed with drink, they never speak one word of their grievances, and the women, who commonly know their husbands' designs, prevent them from doing any injury to each other by hiding their lances, the harpoons, the bows, the arrows, or any other weapon that they have. These mosquitoes are in general very civil and kind to the English, of whom they receive a great deal of respect, both when they are aboard their ships and also ashore, either in Jamaica or elsewhere, whither they often come with the seamen. We always humor them, letting them go any whither as they will, and return to their country in any vessel bound that way if they please. They will have the management of themselves in their striking, and will go in their own little canoe, which our men could not go in without danger of oversetting. Nor will they let any white man come in their canoe, but will go striking in it just as they please, all which we allow them. For should we cross them, though they should see shoals of fish or turtle or the like, they will purposely strike their harpoons and turtle irons aside, or so glance them as to kill nothing. 
They have no form of government among them, but acknowledge the king of England for their sovereign. They learn our language, and they take the governor of Jamaica to be one of the greatest princes in the whole world. While they are among the English, they wear good clothes and take delight to go neat and tight. But when they return again to their own country, they put by all their clothes and go after their own country fashion, wearing only a small piece of linen tied about their waists, hanging down to their knees.